we'll review a technical overview, basically how the, the surge devices work and, and the inner components of those. Uh, we'll review what we have as far as product offering for Eaton, and then uh, talk about the, the UL standard and the recent changes that uh, developed in, in the UL standard. So what is a surge? Many people term a surge an overvoltage, uh, which, which is not necessarily true. Uh, a surge, as it states there, is random high energy short duration electrical disturbance, a disturbance of any kind. Now, the, the key term there is, is short duration. So it happens in, in nanoseconds, and the device, the surge device, has to be able to react quickly enough to, uh, to mitigate that, that type, of, type of issue. When people think of surges, the typical thing that, that people think of is the lightning strike. And it travels down the electrical wires and goes into the house. When in reality, only 20%, estimated 20% of, of the surges actually come from outside, outside the house. 80% uh, are internal. They're, they're the motors starting up, your garage doors, your air conditioners, uh, creating a, a low level surge within the house. So um, again, that goes towards basically a two tier strategy that we'll, we'll talk about here in a second uh, relative to, uh, to surge. Again, people think in their mind, you know, you get a lightning strike, the energy follows the, the electrical infrastructure into your house, travels down the line, and sh uh, sparks fly out of your TV, and it, it blows up, which, you know, hopefully that, that's a dramatic view, and, and hopefully that doesn't happen. Uh, but the reality is uh, most harm is caused by the low-level surges that repeatedly uh, hit your electronic devices and over time degrade them. Um, so, you know, again, the analogy is like, pouring hot water over an ice cube, you know, one, one, one pour is not going to ruin the ice cube, but over time as you continue to degrade that, that uh, ice cube is going to melt away. The, the low level surges continually hitting your electronic equipment continually damage, uh, you know, the junctions, the, the silicone, the, the uh, circuitry on, on your electrical equipment to the point where it degrades and eventually fails. So how do surges really work? What are, what are the internal components? And, and really, they're, they're pretty simple. Uh, there's devices called metal oxide varistors. And, and to me, and this might be not exactly technical, but, but basically, they're a switch. So the, the MOV has very high resistance at low voltage. When the voltage goes high, that resistance goes goes low. So basically, if there's high voltage, that MOV opens up and allows uh, energy or electricity to pass through it. So what we do is we basically take a box or, or device and put MOVs in there, uh, hook them up between the line and, and the ground, and if there's a surge, the MOVs open up and allow that surge to shunt to ground out the ground wire and, and out of the house. Again, as we all know, electricity is looking for the shortest path to ground, the easiest path to ground. So we just use that principle to allow the surge to, to escape the house. Uh, there's, there's a couple different types of MOVs. Um, the typical one that, that we use in a residential world is uh, just the, the MOV, the metal oxide resistor, varistor, I'm sorry, there on the right. Um, you know, basically a blue disc or blue square. Um, they're typically used in type two surge protected devices, and we'll discuss the difference between type two and type one. Um, and they require some sort of overcurrent protection upstream. So they're required to have a breaker upstream uh, to protect them from, from an overcurrent situation. The other kind are thermally protected metal, metal oxide varistors. So for shorthand, we call them TPMOVs. Those are a little more robust. So those don't need a, a breaker upstream to protect them. Uh, they have a little, le uh, little more benign uh, failure mode, uh, and they're, they're encapsulated. They can take a lot more uh, of a short circuit current uh, than 
uh, just a standard MOV. So again, those are used typically in type one applications. Again, we'll, we'll show that here in a second. Okay, there, there's some common vocabulary that, that really was developed in the third edition of UL 1449, um, but this is really how you should, use, how you should compare uh, different surges to each other. So the, the first term that, that we're gonna talk about is surge current capacity. And, and basically, that's how much surge current one time hit the device can take. Uh, usually they're, they're pretty high ratings. Again, our, our ultra level surge is 108 uh, kA per phase. So again, it's a pretty, you know, 100,000 100, amps per phase that, that that device can take at per one time. So again, the arrow says, you know, just for comparison, you wanna look for the highest number you can find. So the analogy is this is like the tread on the tire. This is how much tread you have on that tire and basically is a prediction of the life uh, or performance of that, of that uh, surge device. The next term is the nominal discharge current and, and typically it's denoted as I sub N if you look on any type of label or uh, instruction leaflet, et cetera. So again, that's measured in amps and it's akin uh, to the, the surge current rating, but basically this is the performance. So this is based on the, the UL uh, specification. So it's how well the surge reacts or lives through the various UL, UL tests. So again, the analogy is uh, surge current was relative to the tread life on the tire. This is how well it performs in the obstacle course or the or, or on the test track. So we put the device through its paces, and again, a higher I sub N uh, is, is what you wanna look for. Okay, here's the trick one. Uh, voltage protection rating. This is where you wanna look for a low number. So some people will, will say, you know, what's the clamping voltage? Basically, this is the voltage that the, um, that the MOV will open up with. So, uh, for example, if a surge of 300 volts is coming down the line, my MOV is rated at 600 volts, it's not gonna open up and let that surge go to ground, it's gonna let it continue uh, down into to the other components. So again, for this one, you wanna look for, for the uh, lowest value possible. That's voltage protection rating. And basically, we as Eaton suggest a, a, a two-phase two strategy. Um, you want the, the, first, the first stage to be protection uh, from a whole house level. Uh, again, you have surges coming in from outside of the house, but you also have surges from the inside of the house. Uh, so you want point of use surges as well as a, a surge for the whole house. Think of it as a, a coarse filter versus a, a fine filter. And, even basically the, the IEEE Emerald book says, you know, they suggest a, a two-stage approach. And again, the, the real reason is um, you have a whole house surge that can take a lot of energy, but the VPN is, is very high, right? So uh, the clamping voltage is, is pretty high. It's gonna allow some, some voltage to get through. At that point, you want um, surge protection at each specific location uh, so that takes care of the, the low level surges that the whole house surge has let through. The, the other thing you have to consider, you know, in today's, today's age, um, you know, it's pretty obvious you got your, your TV and your entertainment center and your stereo and I'm gonna put a surge uh, strip on that, which is fine. Um, that, that will help protect. Again, we suggest a whole house surge as well, located in the load center. But the other piece that, that people forget is all the electronics in, in, in your um, appliances. So your refrigerators, your stoves, your microwaves. Uh, how many of us come home at, at night and put your Blackberry or your iPhone or your iPad or whatever you have and just plug it into your kitchen outlet, right? That's not necessarily uh, protected by a, 
by a plug surge. So again, that's why we suggest having uh, a whole house surge that will ensure you have some protection on every, uh, every outlet within your home. So Eaton, in the past we've offered um, both, both uh, stage one as we call it and stage two. Um, now again, that's more of an Eaton euphemism, uh, but there's actually four different types of surge protective devices. Uh, type one, again, is a surge protective device that can be upstream of your main overcurrent device. So it can be upstream of your main. Type two is downstream of your main. So again, you think of uh, the, the, what I call the surge brick or surge block that you're familiar with that, that you see next door. That's a type two device. Uh, type three is a, is a corded device or, or somewhere down farther in the branch circuit. So it has to have at least uh, 10 meters or 30 feet of conductor. So again, that's typically your point of use type surge devices. And then type four is more of an OEM type, machinery OEM. That's, that's a surge device that's integrated into uh, you know, an appliance or a piece of machinery or, or something like that. So in the past, we, we dabbled, we've played in the type three arena, uh, offering uh, point of use surges, surge plugs, uh, but really our core business is in the, in the type one and type two. So stage one is at the sur service entrance. Um, again, uh, we offer a couple different options as far as uh, for the electrical infrastructure as well as your cable and your phone, because obviously uh, you know, surges can enter the house uh, from those aspects as well. Obviously most popular is the, is the surge block that, that connects to your uh, distribution panel. Uh, the, the CHSPT2 is the type two um, surge device that, that we have on the market. Um, we have three different levels. Well, we have a micro, a max, and an ultra. Uh, again, the ultra is up to 108K K per phase, that surge current capacity. Again, that's what you really should uh, use to compare to uh, competitor products. Um, they are suitable for indoor or outdoor. They have LED indication on them, so you know that, that uh, you know, the MOVs are still actively uh, working. They, they do fit universally in basically any load center. Um, because you use a breaker to install them, uh, you can use a square D breaker to install this device in a square D panel or in a Siemens panel or, or G, et cetera. Um, you know, a typical installation can either be mounted inside the panel if you have room, or you can use a knockout, and we do have uh, little bosses that go into the knockout. Um, you see here, uh, we do have specific panels with little standoffs that allow you to mount directly uh, into the panel. Uh, the other nice thing about both the BR and the CH panels that, that have this feature is uh, they have a, uh, a knockout in the dead front or, or the front of the panel that allows you to view the, the status LEDs of, of the device themselves. This is a type one application. Uh, so type one is, um, again, upstream of a main, main, um, main overcurrent device, the main breaker. Uh, the, the biggest application we see is outdoor lighting. Uh, agriculture is big for us as well. Far, farm, irrigation control, that, that sort of thing. It is a robust product uh, that has to be able to you know, uh, be outdoor uh, rated. Um, you can see the picture there. And if you see in the upper right, you see a little black in there. It might be hard to see, but that is our type one device. And that, that is basically spliced in right into the uh, bus conductors there in, in that picture. So again, in our type one series, the CHSP T1 type one, um, again, we have a, a wide range. We have the, the micro max and ultra. We also have a three phase version. If you have a three phase panel, um, we have that, that to offer as well. Indoor, outdoor uh, mounting kit. And um, because this is upstream of the main uh, overcurrent device, 
Uh, we have a two-year warranty on this because, again, it basically has to withstand anything that the utility is uh, going to give it. UL 1449, uh, the third edition took effect in September of, of 2010. But you might still see products floating around that, that are listed as, as second edition. Um, the way it works is basically UL says, okay, up to, up to September 30th, you can continue to build it. And then after th September 30th, you have to start building to the third edition, which means most of the manufacturers that have components laying around uh, build like crazy to build up an inventory and then sell that inventory. You can still sell that after the effective date takes place. Um, we changed over, as Eaton, we changed over pretty quickly, so everything you, you'll purchase today, if you went to distributor, should be third edition, but it is something to look at um, if, you, if you go to, to compare to distributor. So a couple, couple key changes. Um, really, they tried to beef up the, the performance testing in third edition, so we'll talk about that in a, in a second. Uh, we, the third edition is now an ANSI standard, uh, so that, that was a relatively big change. Terminology change, no longer calling a, a TVSS or secondary surge arrestor. Everything is considered an SPD or surge protective device. And then it actually became more encompassing. Uh, in the past, uh, it, it recognized devices of 600 volts and below. Now it expanded to uh, devices 1,000 volts and below. So it, it encompasses uh, more devices. So here's the, the testing method, and this is just a quick comparison. Obviously, I won't read through all of this. Um, but it went from a, a 500 amp surge as, as an initial let through uh, voltage test to now 3,000 amps, so obviously a significant change. And then we went from 20 surges at 3KA to 15 surges, which is less, obviously, but we increased the, the, the KA across. So um, again, it, Less surges, but, it, but it's hitting it with uh, greater surges. And then again, at the end, uh, another, another three surges at, at 3,000 amps instead of 500 amps. Uh, so, and then you measure it and make sure that uh, the, the let-through voltage that it's retained is still within 10% of, of what, it, what it started with. Significant changes, and there was some fallout from the industry as far as people who were able to sustain a product or, or design to this, this requirement. Uh, again, we talked about some of the, the ratings changes. Uh, suppressed voltage rating got changed. The, the verbiage got changed to voltage protection rating, VPR, that we talked about. Um, the, the max surge current for our different devices in our ultra uh, we are now designed to capture events caused by 99% of lightning strikes, right? The, per the warranty, a direct lightning strike, no surge can survive that. But if there's a, a lightning strike in the neighborhood, we can survive 99% of, of uh, the events caused by, by that type of event. And on the micro level, again, uh, being a, a, a little less rated uh, of a device, can survive 90, 90%. So the next question is, OK, what didn't change? Um, the, the, the cable and the telephone units that go along are, are fall under a different uh, UL standard. So those continue to, to be under that different UL standard. Um, if you have devices that are in the field that are that are second edition. They are not defective. They are not, they are not uh, um, bad. Um, they're still working. They're, they, they still should li live up to the, the advertised coverage that, that we provide. So you don't need to go out and change, uh, change all those out or, or panic in any way. Um, basically, and again, another analogy here, you know, we went from just having seat belts to seat belts plus an airbag. So the, the the third edition of the standard is just a more robust standard. We had to upgrade our products a little bit. That doesn't mean the, the second edition um, is any worse 
uh, than, than the third edition. Uh, it's important too as well to, to make sure it, as you're comparing devices uh, that they, they are um, listed or recognized by uh, a listing agency. So again, being a US-based company, we, we bring most things through well. Um, ETL can test, which is, which is an intertech, intertech customer company, I'm sorry. They uh, will list or they will test to 1449. So you'll see that um, compliant to UL 1449. That, that basically means we can't give you a UL stamp or listing, but we tested to that standard. And then obviously CSA and uh, some of the harmonization we've done with, with them as well from, from the UL side. So um, most of our equipment is also CSA listed as well. Here are the, some of the uh, resources available. Again, we have the, the Canadian uh, site with uh, the different surge products on them, and then the Eaton Care or, or TRC um, uh, contact information is there as well. Again, TRC is the group that sits in, in Asheville, North Carolina. They're up to speed on all the specs and kept, can help you either identify which product you need to install or help you with any technical questions that, that you may have. So the question is, how do you test them in the field? Uh, essentially, you can't. Um, it's not an easy way to determine. When the green light goes out. You didn't let me finish my statement. So you can't test them, but that's why we put the LED indication on them, is to be able to tell if the MOV is, is still alive or, or not. And again, the LEDs we have on there, a green LED means I'm, I'm working, I'm living, I'm fine. Um, now obviously, you know, from a homeowner's perspective, you almost have to, to remember that you have that device installed and actively every so often go check it. Obviously if there's a big thunderstorm that rolls through or something like that, it would make sense to check it after that just to make sure everything's intact and you didn't suffer you know, a large surge that knocked everything out, but um, there's no way to test the device as, as it stands. In the, in the type two, which is um, the typical installation in a load center, um, you actually have two overcurrent devices ahead of, ahead of it. Um, the, the brake, the, I'm sorry, the, the brick or block itself gets connected, let me see if I can, uh, Go back here, hopefully I got the right one. Apologize for having to spin through here real quick, but. The, the brick connects into the bus by using a, a two pole breaker. And it, be, it may be very difficult to see that, but on the very end of the bus, you'll see the wires come into the two pole breaker. So you have the main breaker as well as that, that two pole breaker, both of those are offering overcurrent protection. Um, so there's a couple tricks and tips to installing these devices. Number one, again, you wanna make the easiest path for that surge to find ground. So you wanna keep those wires as short as possible. Uh, and you see on there, they're, they're pretty short. Uh, as you lengthen the wire, you're obviously adding impedance and it, you know, you don't make an easy path to ground. So you want to try to make that, that, that wire as short as possible. If you look on this one, and this is, this is actually a bad example to show everybody, but you see the surge and you see the wire go up and then all the way over and then gets uh, in the red, red lug up there on top, that's where it splices in. That's a terrible example because, honestly, uh, because that wire length is, is pretty long. Number two, you don't have an equal wire length. One of, one of the phases goes in, in one of the lugs and the other phase goes in the other lug and you have a difference in impedance there. So that's actually a, a bad installation. You wanna to try to keep it as short as possible and you wanna keep the wire length as even as possible and we even suggest uh, twisting the wires, the, the conductors together before you land them in the breaker or in the splice just to uh, reduce impedance. Any, yes sir?
Yeah, I'm sorry. Those are the older versions uh, of our. Those do not, and we don't we don't uh, market those anymore. Uh, yes. That's a good question. Um, you, Yeah, bas basically, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Again, that's the, that's the trouble with the older devices. The newer devices do, that one in particular does have LED indication. Uh, the older devices, um, you know, it's a, it's a proactive kind of installation. You have to, have to determine um, basically what you think the the life of the device there's obviously a warranty associated with it so once you get over that warranty then it's up to you whether you want to take that off and and replace it with it with a new device 